Hello. In this video, I'm going to discuss a curiosity that must be taken into account when you calculate quantities by taking averages over molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo simulations. This problem concerns the calculation of the error bars in particular. Before we get to that, though, let's begin by first reviewing some basics on molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo simulations and statistical analysis in general. As is perhaps obvious from this first slide, I am assuming that you are working with the plumed plugin for the plugin for molecular dynamics plumed if you are watching this video. One of the main purposes of this code is to take high dimensional trajectory data that emerges from a molecular dynamics simulation, information on the positions of all the atoms in the system, and to generate from this some lower dimensional representation. In other words, the plumed input file provides you with a language that allows you to define complicated functions of the atomic positions that output scalar values. In the language we typically use for plumed, you take the positions of all the atoms at a particular instance in time, which is a 3n dimensional vector of atomic positions, and you calculate this from those positions the value of some collective variable. Hence, when you do this from a molecular dynamics trajectory, you have a time series of variables, of values for the collective variable, as shown here. In other words, you have information on the value that the collective variable took at each point during your molecular dynamics trajectory. To be clear, even though this trajectory of collective variable values contains less information than the full trajectory of all the atoms, it is still a vast amount of information. It is thus not really something that you can put in a scientific paper. Furthermore, a trajectory in and of itself has little predictive value, as two trajectories that start from very similar points will quickly diverge. We should thus not think of our trajectory as a deterministic prediction for how the future will plan out. What we should do instead is to suppose that each of the CV values in our trajectory represents a random variable that is sampled from some at present unknown probability distribution. It doesn't matter precisely what this distribution is, because we know that if we take a sufficiently large number of samples from the distribution and add them together as shown here, the distribution for the aggregate quantity will be a Gaussian centred on the expectation for this distribution. In other words, we can use the central limit theorem to analyse our trajectory data and to thus obtain quantities from our analysis that have true predictive values. Things get even better when we rewrite the central limit theorem in terms of the probability distribution density function for s over n rather than the cumulative probability distribution function for s over n as we've done here. When we rewrite the central limit theorem in this way, we find the following. This function is shown plotted in the graph here. As you can see, the variance of this Gaussian is equal to sigma squared over n. So, as we increase the number of samples we take, as we increase the length of our trajectory, we see that we have greater confidence in the estimate that we get for the true expectation by taking s over n. In other words, if we run our trajectories for longer, we get better information about the underlying expectations and the ensemble averages. This is great, but we shouldn't get carried away, as there is a fly in the ointment. The central limit theorem is only valid when the random variables that we add up are independent. Before we use this result to analyse trajectory data, we should thus ask ourselves if it is safe to assume that the set of CV values that we extract from a typical simulation trajectory are independent. We can answer this question by calculating something known as an autocorrelation function. The value of this function at tau essentially measures whether or not two values of some quantity calculated tau time steps apart are correlated on average. For uncorrelated data, it would look typically something like the curve shown on the left here. When tau is equal to 0, the autocorrelation function r of tau is equal to 1, as the values of the CV at time t is also always perfectly correlated with the value of the CV at time t plus zero, 
as these two quantities are the same. For all tau greater than zero, however, r of tau is equal to zero, as no other pairs of variables are correlated. The curve on the right shows the autocorrelation function for data from a typical MD simulation. This is once again equal to 1 when tau is equal to 0, as any random variable is perfectly correlated with itself. At variance with the curve on the right, however, the autocorrelation function does not immediately drop down to a value of 0 when tau is greater than 0. In other words, there is some correlation between the value that a CV will take during the next MD step and the value the CV currently has. The fact that there are time correlations in the values of CVs makes a lot of sense. After all, we know that it takes a long time for atoms to diffuse into a new configuration. For the purposes of the analysis, however, it looks like a bit of a disaster, as the fact that there are correlations between the CV values suggests that we cannot use the central limit theorem to analyse all this data. We cannot use this theorem, as remember, it only works if we take identically distributed and independent random variables and add them together. If we can't use the central limit theorem, what then should we do? How should we go about analysing the trajectory? Well, a first step could be to plot a graph of the CV data from a typical trajectory. What we would find if we did this, and if our simulation was properly equilibrated, would be that the data looks something like the curve shown on the left here, and not like the curve shown on the right. In the graph on the left, the CV value is fluctuating around a particular value. In the graph on the right, however, the value of the CV on average drips upward, drifts upwards with time. The simulation on the right is a simulation of a system that is coming slowly towards equilibrium. In the simulation on the left, by contrast, the system is at equilibrium and the average value of the CV is thus relatively stationary throughout the whole trajectory. The fact that the average CV value is stationary should not surprise us. We know from statistical mechanics, after all, that the probability of having a particular value for the CV is given by the expression shown at the top right of the slide. Furthermore, it is not much of a stretch from this expression to arrive at an expression for the ensemble average, as shown here. What I'm trying to get at is that we have good reason for believing that our MD simulation is sampling from a stationary probability distribution, and that the averages we extract by adding together the values of CVs from all the trajectory frames should give us meaningful information. In fact, we can get the estimates for the ensemble average in precisely this way. We just add up all the values the CV took in all the trajectory frames and divide by the number of trajectory frames. The average that we extract from this process will give us meaningful information about the true ensemble average. Furthermore, this is all mathematically sound because of another limit theorem, which is known as the law of large numbers. The problem is thus not with estimating the ensemble average. The problem concerns how we estimate the error bars on our ensemble average. It turns out that if we estimate the error bars in the normal way, using all the data from the trajectory, we will underestimate the error because of the correlations. We thus need to find some way to calculate error bars that correct for the underestimation that comes about because our data is correlated. The technique for doing this that I will introduce in this video is known as block averaging and a plumed input file that does block averaging is shown here. Let's consider what this input would do with the CV data from the 12 trajectory frames shown at the top of the slide. In essence, it tells plumed to take the S values for the input shown here, S is the distance between atoms 1 and 2, from each set of three consecutive frames and to calculate an average from them. For the 12 frames shown here, we would thus calculate four averages. S1 prime is equal to S1 plus S2 plus S3 all over 3. S2 prime is equal to S4 plus S5 plus S6 all over 3. S3 prime is equal to S7 plus S8 plus S9 all over 3. And S4 prime is equal to S10 plus S11 plus S12 all over 3. These four numbers, S1 prime, S2 prime, S3 prime, and S4 prime, are our block averages.
What precisely is the point of this block averaging procedure? Before answering that question, let's clarify that something that is not happening in this case. In previous videos, you will have seen that block averages calculated from independent and identically distributed random variables in a manner similar to what I've shown here have values that are relatively consistent. Furthermore, because of the central limit theorem, you will have seen that the estimates of the expectations that you get from each block of data get closer and closer together as you increase the lengths of the blocks over which the averaging is performed. In the movie shown here, I'm showing what happens to the values of the block averages as you increase the lengths of the blocks over which the averaging is performed. As you can see, the values do get slightly more consistent, but it's nothing as spectacular as what happens with uncorrelated data. This is not the point, however. The point is what happens to the autocorrelation function when it is calculated using block averages rather than the raw data. If you remember, all of our problems stem from the fact that there are correlations between the CV values that we get from adjacent trajectory frames. Furthermore, these correlations between the CV values are clearly seen when we calculate the autocorrelation function, which is shown again for the trajectory slay data on this slide. Let's now suppose that we calculate the autocorrelation function between our block averages instead of the block raw trajectory data. The values shown will thus tell us something about the degree of correlation between the block averages calculated at time t and at time t plus tau. What you can see from the movie on this slide is that as the blocks become longer, the degree of correlation between the block averages decreases to zero. In other words, by taking block averages, we have converted correlated trajectory data into uncorrelated data from which we can calculate ensemble averages and error bars using the central limit theorem. Furthermore, because the data is now uncorrelated, we can calculate the error bars for these ensemble averages. Let's try to understand this a bit better by looking at the mathematics of what we are doing here a bit more carefully. This process of block averaging has allowed us to take our correlated trajectory data and to convert it to uncorrelated data that we can analyse using the normal tricks based on the central limit theorem. It is important to note here that any average that we estimate by taking the average of the block averages, S1 prime, S2 prime and so on, will be equal to the estimate that we get by taking the averages by adding all the data from the trajectory frames, S1, S2, and so on. This fact is relatively easy to confirm as follows. We know that in the case shown here, S1 prime is equal to S1 plus S2 plus S3 divided by 3, as shown here. If we take the ensemble averages of all these quantities, and if we exploit the, la the linearity of the ensemble average operator, we get the following. We know that the distribution from which S1 is sampled is the same as the distribution from which S2 and S3 are sampled, so we can see that the right-hand side of this expression is just three times the ensemble average for S over 3. That is to say, the right-hand side of this expression is equal to the ensemble average for the CV. We can put this mathematics in a slightly different way. It is very easy to show, using the same logic that I've just demonstrated, that the following two summations are exactly equal. To be clear here, the sum on the left is the sum over the whole data series, and the SI values are the values of the CV in each of the trajectory frames. The sum on the right, meanwhile, is the sum over the block averages. Now, the sum on the left, the sum of the data series, is our estimate of the ensemble average. So, by the transitive property, the sum on the right over the block averages must also be equal to the ensemble average. The block averaging thus gives us the ensemble average for the distribution which, from which the MD simulation was sampling. I mention all this because the same cannot be said of our estimate for the variance. The variance that we estimate from our block averages is calculated using the expression shown at the bottom right of this slide. This is not the variance for the random variables from which our trajectory was sampled. It is the variance between the block averages, which are sampled from some different and unknown distribution. 
The fact that the value of sigma squared that we calculated from this process represents the variance between our block averages is important when it comes to remembering our ultimate purpose. We want to calculate the error bars around the estimate of the ensemble average that we extracted. To do this, we need to recall the central limit theorem and work out what the terms are in this case. Obviously, sigma is the square root of the variance that we have calculated between our uncorrelated quantities, our block averages. Importantly, however, we have only calculated nb of these uncorrelated quantities, as we have only calculated nb block averages. Thus, the n that we should use in this expression should be nb. Our final error bar is thus the square root of sigma squared divided by nb. The final estimates for our ensemble averages and the associated error bars are shown plotted here with different lengths of block averaging. The graph on the left shows what you see when you go through this process with uncorrelated data that represents samples from a uniform random variable. As you can see, the, er the size of the error bars does not change much with the length of the block averaging. In this case, we thus do not need to do any block averaging in order to get a reasonable estimate for the error associated with our estimate of the ensemble average. The graph on the right shows the situation we will have if the data contains correlations, like the data uh, uh, from a, the like, like those that would be in the data from a trajectory. With very, when very short block averages are calculated, you can see that the error bars are much smaller than the error bars you get when block averages are calculated over longer blocks of trajectory. In other words, the error bar is underestimated when the block averages are short because of the correlations between the values of the CV and adjacent trajectory frames. Once the, error bars be once the block average sizes become long, however, the error bars settle down to a pretty consistent size. In this case, the error bars calculated, which are when, when the when block averages are performed over 55, 60, or 65 trajectory frames, are all relatively consistent. The reason for this is that once we average over a large enough amount of data, the correlations between the block averages disappear. When we are analysing simulation data, we should thus calculate our error bars for different lengths of block averages and draw graphs like those shown here. The lengths of our block averages in our final published results should be long enough so that we've reached the plateau region at which our error bar is not increasing with the length of the block averaging. Let's just finish by quickly summarising everything that we've covered in this video. We started by noting that there is a problem in analysing trajectory, analysing data from a simulation trajectory as the values of the CV we calculate from our trajectory at time t and t plus some small number will be correlated, as the diffusive processes by which atoms move around at equilibrium are relatively slow. This is a problem not because we cannot estimate ensemble averages from simulation trajectory, the trajectory still samples from a stationary distribution, and thus any average that we get by adding together the values of all the CVs in all the trajectory frames is still a reasonable guess at the ensemble average. The problem is that any estimate we have for the error bar is unreliable. To resolve this, we introduce the process of block averaging, which involves splitting our trajectory into blocks and calculating separate averages from each of these blocks of data as shown here. The great benefit of this technique is that it effectively converts the correlated trajectory into uncorrelated data, which we can analyse using the conventional statistic tools, statistical tools that are based on the central limit theorem. We can thus estimate the variance between our estimates of the block averages using the expression shown here. We can then arrive at a final estimate for the error bar using the expression shown at the bottom of the slide. This technique should be used whenever ensemble averages are calculated from molecular dynamics calculations, as reporting errors on the quantities you estimate from these simulations is very important. Furthermore, there are relatively simple variants on this technique that can be used if you are calculating histograms or if you are working with simulation biases. These techniques are discussed in the remainder of the tutorial. Thank you for your attention.